I love that solo. That's the beginning of Scheherazade, Rimsky Korsakov's fabulous uh, tone poem, if you will, about uh, Scheherazade, who has to tell a thousand and one stories to the king in order to uh, spare her, her life. Um, beautiful, beautiful piece, brilliantly orchestrated. Uh, really a master course uh, in how to write for an orchestral ensemble for an orchestra. Hi, my name is Igor Yusufovich. I am uh, one of the leaders of the BBC Symphony Orchestra and I'd like to welcome you to my studio. Uh, when I meet people, I'm often asked, what do you do? Uh, and my natural answer is, well, I play violin. I'm one of the leaders of the BBC Symphony. Uh, and they say, well, what, what is a leader? What does that mean? And so over the years, that, that has gotten me thinking about what exactly this role is. It is an incredibly complex uh, job title, one that's very difficult to, to explain in words uh, or to, to put down on a job description. It's the first violinist of the orchestra. It's the person that's always late to the show, always walking out later than the rest of the orchestra, just before the conductor walks out. Um, it's the person that's responsible for marking all the bowings in the parts, uh, but then in a more complex uh, dimension, it's the person uh, who is responsible for interpreting the wishes of the conductor uh, and finding a way to transfer them into, into music, into playing their instrument, and at the same time, uh, finding a way to get the orchestra to be on the same page about what it is that you're doing. Um, there is, uh, I would think, a great deal of diplomacy that's needed uh, to be successful in that job. You are stuck between a rock and a hard place sometimes uh, because you do represent the orchestra, but uh, you also have to make sure that the conductor is able to get what, you're, what they're asking. Um, and to do it in a very collegial and respectful manner. And then lastly, I think it's, it's fair to compare it to being a, a team captain on a football team. Uh, you've got the coach, you've got the manager, which is the conductor, and, uh, but they are, in sports, they are on the sidelines. Uh, so you as the team captain are on the pitch and it's your responsibility to get everyone on the same page, get everyone moving in the same way and uh, inspire when needed uh, and also lead by example. So oftentimes I'm asked, what's the difference between a leader and a concertmaster? Um, and in some ways you could say it's the same as the difference between a fiddle and a violin. Essentially it's the same thing, uh, just different terms. A fiddle is a more endearing term for the violin, which is a bit more well, proper. I play the violin. If you say I play the fiddle, people assume that you're a, a folk musician. Uh, but with concertmaster or leader, it's the same exact job title, uh, just different names. Uh, concertmaster is referred to in the U.S. in most parts of the world. In the U.K., uh, the job of the first violinist is referred to as leader, and perhaps that's because it originated in Europe. Uh, the, the role originated, it, it grew out of uh, court ensembles, uh, which were so prevalent uh, during the Baroque era. How has it changed over the years? Well, so if you think back to the Baroque era, uh, where the composer or the conductor was also the harpsichord player, uh, and in the ensemble, they would nod and lead the tempos and show uh, dynamic differences perhaps, or uh, in, in find ways to, to really lead the ensemble. Uh, the first violinist at the time was referred to just as the leader, uh, and they didn't have a lot of responsibility because it all fell to the harpsichord player. Now in the 18th century, when the orchestral genre be began to emerge, uh, more and more and composers started to write for larger ensembles, uh, the keyboard player was still usually the, the main person, the conductor, but the music 
was becoming a bit more complex, so it was probably becoming a bit more difficult for them to play and lead at the same time. So the role of the first violinist started to become a bit more of uh, a leadership role and they, they took on more and more uh, leadership uh, responsibilities. Then of course with the 19th century the orchestras grew in size uh, quite dramatically. Uh, the music was becoming very very much more complex. Uh, a, lot, a lot of new instruments were being added and uh, the composers started to also realize the importance of a first violinist, of a concertmaster, of a leader, and so we began to see uh, some important solos being given to the first violinist. During that time as well, uh, I think symphonic works began to outnumber uh, works written for the keyboard. Um, and so again, the role of the violinist or a string player became more and more popular. Then of course, with modern times, with the 20th century, uh, contemporary music as we refer to it, uh, the shape, the size of the orchestra, the instrumentation was really kind of affirmed and set in stone. And uh, so the role of the conductor, which used to be the harpsichord player, uh, well, there, there, there really was no way that they could play keyboard and conduct at the same time, as well as the fact that more and more works were being written without the keyboard as a leading instrument. Uh, so conductors be, uh, started to become music directors of orchestras. Uh, they added a lot more responsibilities to their uh, to their play programming, the season of the orchestra, being responsible for the personnel, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and so, of course, the leadership of the ensemble role started to become the prime responsibility of the concertmaster or the leader of the orchestra. You know, the, players joining me. Uh, we will often set up bowings in such a way that it naturally produces the sound that we think we need or we think the composer wanted. Um, there are many tricks that we can do with bowings. Uh, if, for example, we know there's a passage that um, our natural instinct will be to rush through, we might uh, adapt a bowing uh, that will effectively slow us down a little bit and help us hold hold uh, in place and, and keep pace. Uh, there are bowings that are easier to play but don't sound as interesting um, and then there are bowings that do the opposite. An example of something like that, uh, a hooked bowing, so what you would see in a dotted rhythm for example. It's quite easy to play. Uh, because it's just down, up, down, up with a little hook here and there. But what you would miss is oftentimes the attack on the short note. So if, for example, if, if the composer wanted uh, a very strict uh, rhythm, it would be quite difficult to get that while hooking because a lot of energy goes into stopping the bow, restarting it and stopping it very quickly uh, and doing it over and over and over and over. So we would look at that as, uh, and say, why don't we separate the, the slur that's inevitably going to be there and just say... Now that's much harder to do because there's a lot more energy that goes in, but it might sound more interesting and it so might sound more uh, close to what the composer had in mind when they wrote this. Visual, of course it's nice when you've got a group of 16 uh, violinists and 14 seconds and 12 uh, violas and 10 cellos all moving in the same direction. You can imagine uh, looking at a tree where all the branches are swaying together and it's quite beautiful. Uh, or you could look at a forest and you see trees just going all over the place and it's a big storm and uh, so we have to keep that in, in mind and take that into account. There are of course times when we would say let's do free bowing here. Why do we do that? It's generally not meant to say play opposite of what the person next to you is doing. Um, 
we will try to keep within the same direction, but some people might change a note or two earlier and some people might change a note or two later. Uh, a perfect example for, um, in the opening of a Brahms symphony uh, where we have this incredible long line in the, in the violins and we don't want to hear a bow change in it. So. Now you might hear quite a few bow changes here, but when you add 15 other players to it and you say, let's everyone change slightly at a different time, it will all get smoothed out and it will really truly sound like one long line. So that's the, the fundamentals of, of, of bowings. Uh, and what I, what I mentioned earlier also, just if, if I see a crescendo in a part, um, and a long line, my general reaction would be to let's start up bow and get a really nice natural crescendo. Um, obviously, with the opposite of that, we'll start strong. For a nice diminuendo towards the tip, the lighter part of the bow. Other roles of the concertmaster, well, I mentioned uh, interpreting the conductor's wishes. Of course, the, the whole orchestra is doing that all the time, but uh, as the string section, at, uh, at the very least, is looking towards the leader for, um, for information on how to play a certain stroke or where in the bow to play something, uh, it's the leader's job to figure out fairly quickly, in fact, quite instantly, what a conductor's gesture might mean, how the conductor wants that sound to be created, um, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of there's a lot of activity that has to happen here, with the ears, uh, with watching, with listening, with uh, interpreting, with sometimes guessing, uh, and reacting, all at the same time, um, all while playing what's on the page in front of you. And of course, a certain amount of diplomacy is needed uh, when at times things get a, a bit heated and the conductor is really insistent on something and the orchestra isn't quite giving it to them uh, the way that they would want it to be. Um, it becomes the role of the leader to, to find a compromise, find something where the orchestra can deliver something that the conductor will find a way to, to be happy with. So, thinking about repertoire and uh, some of the most notable solos that are written for the concertmaster for, for the leading violin uh, in orchestral repertoire, one of the earliest solos that comes to mind is the uh, solo from Bach's uh, St. Matthew Passion. Uh, and it's a beautiful, haunting movement, um, the Erbarmi Dich. Well, it's an aria that the contralto sings and uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous uh, duet that's intertwined between the two voices, between the violin and the singer. Uh, and it starts out with this uh, really, really beautiful violin line. Within the vocal repertoire, another another great solo that comes to mind is uh, from Sanctus in uh, Beethoven's Missa Solemnis, and this is another extended violin solo, one for which a concertmaster unusually, uh, traditionally now, stands and plays along with the singers. 
that are the soloists. Um, and it starts out after this long sort of uh, calming down that the orchestra does after a very tumultuous uh, opening of the movement and uh, gives me, the concertmaster, uh, the time to stand up and kind of get, get in place. Uh, and it starts with this really lovely duet with the flute as well. And so on and so on, and the woodwinds join, and then of course the rest of the strings as well. But concertmaster solos aren't always slow and melodic and beautiful, uh, as much as we might wish <laughs> they were. Uh, take for example this uh, quirky fun solo from Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. Uh, this is something that the violin plays first, uh, and it's answered by the flute, uh, and it's a bit of a tug of war who can outdo each other, who can have more fun with it. Now, one of the biggest solos in the orchestral repertoire, um, one that I enjoy playing quite a bit, uh, is of course uh, Strauss's Heldenleben. And this extended violin solo represents uh, the hero of, of, the, of the story. And it's incredibly demanding, not only technically, but uh, also emotionally, because within a very short phrase, you've got to go from happy and go lucky to uh, incredibly uh, sad and heartbroken to uh, poised and strong and sort of ready to lead uh, into battle. Uh, take for example this short excerpt. Since I've worked with the BBC Symphony Orchestra for the last two years, um, I've encountered some uh, really new and eye-opening playing techniques, if you will. Uh, some things that uh, composers have uh, put into their parts. Uh, lots of things that have, in my experience, have never been done before. A lot of new techniques that have been developed or created. Um, many times it works. Sometimes uh, it leaves us wondering if perhaps the composer had something else in mind. Uh, but uh, it's always interesting to look at something and to, to see, uh, you know, a little asterisk on, the, on a page and then, like in a book, you have to flip to the footnotes or the, or, or the front of the page on the, on the first page and you have this long description of uh, instructions on how to play a certain passage or how to play a certain uh, a stroke or a certain symbol that, that you'll find in the part. Uh, one that I uh, particularly remember uh, very well was a piece that we had done recently and uh, it really caught the whole section by surprise because we were, we were looking at the part trying to decipher what 
this symbol and what this explanation really meant. And we had this idea that the composer was going for something that uh, created white noise. Uh, so basically just something like this, just um, luckily the composer was there with us uh, and was able to explain to us that in fact what they were looking for was something quite different. So might sound quite similar but a very different stroke and one that we would never have thought of uh, because that in some ways goes against the idea of playing the violin where we move the bow from you know left to right and uh, it really did a mind trick on us it, every time I remember every time we got to this spot we had to kind of tell ourselves uh, okay stop moving the way you normally move and you know do this kind of uh, one of these you know one of the, one of these moments uh, so that was that was quite fun to do and uh, you know, nowadays you always uh, you always find something where the composer wants us to either you know tap on the wood of the violin or uh, do something uh, with the traditional uh, techniques, something like ponticello. Um, you know, you get that glassy sound. Um, an interesting technique that I found. Uh, uh, with uh, the music of Piazzolla, Argentinian tango music, for example. Uh, there is an Argentinian, uh, or perhaps it's Brazilian instrument called the guiro, and it's a percussion instrument. It's a wooden uh, elongated thing, looks like a long coconut or a pineapple or a cone, and you have a stick and it has ridges on it and you move the stick, <laughs> makes this kind of sound. So, uh, Biazzolo figured out a way to do this on the string instruments. Um, many, many of us violinists uh, in particular were trying to do it, we're trying to mimic it by scratching the string basically. And but if you scratch the string, no matter how hard you press, there's this risk of actually getting the note, which is not what they wanted. So, um, Someone actually explained this to me. What Piazzolla had in mind was to actually play not on the string, but to play on the threads of the strings. So, and you get that real sort of wooden, wooden stick on a wooden instrument sound. Uh, so that was quite fun. That was a fun experiment to do. And you'll find that uh, example in all of Piazzolla, uh, Piazzolla's tango music. Um, you know, and then of course you have the ricochet and the, the regular bowing techniques which composers uh, are using uh, all the time. Uh, but I think from, from a performer's perspective, what we always uh, like to see on a page is for a clear idea of what the composer wants. So if you have a sound in mind that, um, that you're not sure about how to notate it, how to describe it, make sure that you talk to the performers or find somebody who plays the instrument that you want uh, the sound to be played on first and talk to them and say, look, is, is this actually possible? Uh, this is what I have in mind. Uh, it sounds something like this or play a recording of wherever you heard this sound and work with them. Uh, because oftentimes you might you might be surprised it might be much better done on a different instrument or it might be done in a way that you, you know you perhaps hadn't thought of um, so it's always good to involve the performer in the creative process as well now the violin that I'm currently playing on is a relatively modern instrument it was made in the late 80s by a French violin maker named Christophe Landon uh, Christophe lives in New York and has a workshop uh, in, in Manhattan and he makes some fabulous, fabulous instruments. I was very fortunate uh, that he had uh, kindly pro provided me with this instrument for use. Um, 
it's it's an interesting instrument because it's a copy of uh, Guarneri del Gesù's violin uh, that has a uh, name uh, Kemp. Um, the original, the Guarneri, was uh, made in 1738. So the top of the violin is made of two pieces of spruce joined together. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, although the violin dates to the late 80s, 1980s that is, the wood itself is over a hundred years old now because Christoph bought it uh, when uh, he was quite young, as he says, and uh, has had it uh, sitting in his uh, workshop for about uh, 50 years before he made it. So uh, it's, it's aged uh, before, it was, before it was actually built. The back of the instrument is made of one piece maple uh, slab and uh, it has a slightly more pronounced uh, flaming than the original. It's very closely re resembling it, but just a bit more pronounced. Um, so it's even more strikingly beautiful um, when you look at it and you've got these gorgeous tiger uh, stripes, as we call them, running across the across the back of the instrument. So a really great violin, um, really quite fortunate to be able to use it and to make music on it.